Hello, and welcome to Semantic Reactions, the official podcast of the Institute of General Semantics. My name is Ben Houck, and I'm happy to be able to introduce the fifth episode in our ongoing series. For our first podcast of the new year, IGS President Lance Strait interviews the science fiction author and media theorist Paul Levinson. Their discussion ranges across several topics, including general semantics and science fiction, science and politics, and free speech and social media. The episode ends with a reading by Paul Levinson from his alternate history short story about the Beatles. It's real life. This is Lance Strait, and I'm here for another episode of Semantic Reactions with my friend and colleague, Paul Levinson. Uh, like myself, Paul is a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University and received his PhD from the Media Ecology Program at New York University, studying with Neil Postman, Christine Nystrom, and Terry Moran. So, Paul, I wanted to talk to you, uh, start off talking to you about science fiction. It's uh, something that we're both enthusiastic about, but uh, in particular that you are a science fiction author for quite a long time now, uh, as well as a past president of the uh, Science Fiction Writers Association. Is that the correct name? It's actually the the literally correct name is the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, uh, uh, but it's also known as SFWA, and that you know can be uh, extended to just Science Fiction Writers of America. But sometimes it is also the A that stands for America is also sometimes. Uh, referred to as association because we're not really limited to the United States or even uh, the Western Hemisphere. So it's, you know, like most other things in life, even that name is something of a mess, but but that's what it is. Well, that, that works very well with the basic general semantics principle that the map is not the territory. Yes, so. absolutely. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, um, as you know, um, there are a number of science fiction authors who are associated with general semantics and took inspiration from them. Uh, and uh, I, I know we've talked about this previously, so I'd like to get your thoughts about some of them just to start off with. Um, and uh, the first one, I'm never quite sure how to pronounce his name, A.E. Van Vogt, V-O-G-T. Do you know how to pronounce his name? No, again, it has, I've heard it, I don't know anything, but uh, I think the G is to some extent silent, although since it's not an English name, I, when I hear non-English people speak it, it sounds to me like they're saying a even vote. I mean, with like just like this, like maybe 10% of the G sound from the G. So it's mm -hmm. mostly silent. What it, what I'm sure it's not is A.E. Van Volkt or something like that. It's, it, it's closer to vote, but with just the slight impression of the G. And that's, of course, v, Van and then V-O-G-T. Correct. And uh, you are you have read some of his work. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's he's like, you know, one of these people, I mean, and, and you know, in case your listeners aren't as aware as you and I are of the literal history of science fiction, when people talk about the, the golden age of science fiction, and that's the 1950s, usually that discussion focuses on, on three main people, uh, Isaac Asimov, Robert Heinlein, and Arthur C. Clarke. And then when it moves down to a slightly secondary level, you get uh, people like Bester, uh, James Blish, a great writer. A. E. Van Vogt, though, sometimes is overlooked in those schemas because he actually began publishing and having an impact a tiny bit earlier than the 1950s. And actually in the 1940s, when, when Asimov and Heinlein were just starting out uh, Vogt was starting out also, but he actually had a, a larger, uh, a more immediate impact. And he, uh, you, you know, is is also someone who uh, uh, 
was one of the first people to write about mutations, which is sort of interesting uh, because if you if you think about the history of science fiction, and, and here there's a, a strong parallel between the evolution of species and the evolution of language, there, there's a connection right there. And one of the things uh, that Volk looked into is how language itself would evolve. And he was one of the first people who took seriously well, what would uh, you know? Some non-human species. How would they speak? How would they communicate? And he was not a hard scientist in the sense that you uh, occasionally had some science fiction writers uh, write. Um, I mean, for example, uh, Carl Sagan would probably be the best example of someone. I once actually corresponded with Sagan, not to go on too much of a, a distraction on that. And I said, well, you're not really a hard scientist. You're, you know, a popularizer of science. And, and, he, uh -oh. and by the way, yeah, and he actually, uh, it was because I was talking about his work as uh, the book editor of et cetera, way back in the, in the 70s. And he, of course, that was before email. He sends me a letter back and saying, look, I'm happy to correspond with you, but I am a hard scientist. You know, so, uh, uh, so he's an example of someone who brought both in his in his uh, nonfiction popular uh, work about science, but also in his science fiction the the rigor of a scientist. Um, none of the others really did, but uh, A. E. Van Vogt is uh, of all of those people that I mentioned. He is most interested in evolution, the evolution of everything, and. You know, one of the things that's always struck me as as interesting, and um, this actually is also a language issue, but it's not often enough discussed as a language issue, is if you think about it, DNA is itself a language, right? It's it's a code uh, it, it, in many ways, and and this like gets uh, you know a little bit into McLuhan. It's an abstract code like the alphabet itself, because the the instructions in the DNA don't look like anything that the DNA produces. It organizes proteins so that they become hearts, lungs, brains, and so on. And uh, but I think Vogt got that without actually saying that, and that reflects itself uh, in, in his work. Although technically, we would say, I mean, DNA is not a language; it's a code, but. You know, we try to reserve the term language for for something more specific. But I mean, it's it's certainly a good point. And 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 Volk was also interested in evolution, which, which seems to be one of the kind of overarching themes of much of science fiction in the 20th century. Um, so I note that um, his book, uh, his his novel, Voyage of the Space Beagle where he has uh, something that's, uh, I mean, I think it's called like nexium, nexism or something that is um, basically general semantics, but it's also considered, uh, you know, the, the reference to the beagle is a reference to Darwin. And some believe, some consider it to be the uncredited basis of the movie Alien. Yeah, well, that's yet another issue. And that's a fascinating issue. And we can talk about that, you know, in terms of uncredited uh, inspirations. Uh, the, uh, on the one hand, you have this, this beautiful, in, in a platonic sense, the epitome of, of like the beauty of creativity. You bring into existence something which didn't exist before. And that's, I think, what most people assume creative people do. Uh, but when you look at their work, uh, you can always find precedence. And I'm not talking about explicit plagiarism. That's actually easy enough to identify. But, you know, just more, you know, the general uh, inspiration. And, uh, you know, not to go too far afield from science fiction, sometimes uh, even a court of law might decide that's plagiarism, but it wasn't. If you think about uh, George Harrison's My Sweet Lord, it sounds mm -hmm. like the uh, Chiffon song and they, they sued him and he settled out of court uh, about that. Um, you know, My Sweet Lord and He's So Fine. And that's a Chiffon song. But uh, Harrison always said, no, I didn't consciously plagiarize that. Sure, I heard that song. It was in my head. 
And so, you know, the people who did Alien, uh, I have no idea if they even read uh, Van Boat's uh, Voyage of the uh, Space Beagle, but, um, you know, certainly it is influenced by that. Yeah. Well, and of course, his Nale books are are the, the best known examples of uh, general semantics influence Nale for non-Aristotelian. But some people find it them difficult to understand uh, well to look, follow yeah well because he's a he uh he loves ideas uh as much as he loves action and uh you know that's always a, a problem if, if somebody is looking for more action and he, one of the uh things about van vogt is that his, his uh his all of his works are chock full of uh different ideas and they move very quickly and you have to take your time you know with his work and read it and and understand it uh and and give his ideas a chance to percolate into your head and understanding but um i wouldn't recommend van vogt to somebody who just wants some you know escapist science fiction uh you know as as entertainment and I think, you know, you once said to me about the difference in how old you are when you read these uh, these stories. Oh, yeah, that's right. I thought I, I was just talking to about how, uh, lamenting how old I am in any case. But uh, I mean, I, honestly, though, to tell you the truth about Van Vogt, I haven't reread his work. So, I mean, I, I, it's an interesting mm -hmm. point. As I mentioned before, Van Vogt was sort of lost, you know, in, in what is usually considered the golden age of science fiction. Right. But I I read his work literally for the first and only time at the end of the 1950s, when to me in the library, when I, you know, on the one side there was Asimov, on the other side there was Van Vogt, I mean, and then there were some, you know, names in between. Uh, his work was the, the logical work uh, for me to read, and, and I love them. So, I don't know what it says about me, but my understanding of Van Vogt is the understanding of like a 11, 12, 13 year old. And what I now know about his work, I just think back on what I read then. Mm -hmm. That's in contrast to Isaac Asimov. And that's probably what I was talking to you about. Asimov's work, I, I in particular, the Foundation series, I read uh, them in their entirety, Let's see, back in uh, 1957, 1958, so that was uh, the first time. Then uh, I, uh, when I was uh, taking a course in science fiction at NYU, this was on the undergraduate level, I decided to write my final paper on the then still a trilogy, the Foundation Trilogy, but I didn't trust my memory, so I wanted to read it then as... I guess, uh, you know, 21, 22 year old. And then I read them again in their entirety when Simon, who is actually in, you know, the, it's sometimes joked that the golden ages of, of science fiction is 11, 12 years old. When he was that age, he became interested in science fiction. So I recommended the books to him. He read those novels and I read them yet again. I remember we'd walk around the block talking about them. Simon's and your son. Time is my son, right? Uh, and um, and he has now a lifelong love of science fiction. Uh, but um, come to think of it, I didn't read them again, but I got immersed in them again watching the uh, Apple uh, TV Plus uh, first season of Foundation, which, by the way, I didn't think. I was as good as the novels and that's, and I wanted to love it. And, you know, we can talk about that. That's an interesting point also in terms of, you know, media theory and, and general semantics, because uh, the, 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 the language of television uh, is very different from the language of words on a page and uh, that of all of the great works of science fiction has been one of the last to be put on a screen. David Goyer is the one who receives, uh, you know, credit for that. He's the creator. He, you know, put together this whole project. 
and I, I admire the hard work that he put into it uh, in terms of the work, but I don't admire all that much the result of it. So that's my fourth, you know, immersion in that story. And uh, what it did is it made me appreciate the original written stories more than that story, the television series. And and I was going to get to that. So I know that Isaac Asimov is a big influence for you and uh, and that he is uh, contemporary with these others, these other folks. And uh, of course, the foundation brings in this concept of psychohistory which uh again i isn't uh as far as i know there's no clear link to again to general semantics or or krasipsky the way the way there is with some other authors but it seems to be of that time you know the idea that uh science science somehow will allow us to crack a lot of these codes not just the genetic code but uh also the code of the mind and and in this case historical coding as well uh, how well do you think that concept has stood up? Because I know there's been like a kind of movement away from that in some of the sequels, especially by other authors. Yeah, well, first of all, a couple of things. One of the points about the Foundation uh, series and Isaac Asimov's work in general, including his robot st- uh, stories and novels, is that they have literally, and this gets back to our earlier point, inspired real life scientists and uh, in the case of Paul Krugman he's a Nobel laureate for economics he says that I'm not sure how old he was probably again 11 12 years old you know the golden age that he had read those uh, books those novels when he was that age and that's what inspired him to become an economist Uh, and then you have people like Marvin Minsky who uh, was an MIT AI scientist and he said Asimov's robot novels inspired him to do that but there are many ways of looking at at psychohistory and uh, an obvious way which I think is not often enough uh, pointed out is if you think about what polling is today you know, whether it's political polling, just, you know, what people are going to do polling about anything. In a way, it's a kind of psychohistory because you're gathering data on what people are doing or saying they're going to do or thinking about what they're going to do. And you are using that data to project what's going to happen in the future. That's exactly what psychohistory uh, was and is. But obviously, in terms of polling, it's often incorrect. So, you know, in terms of political polling, uh, it it was incorrect in 2016. Uh, It it was incorrect in 2018. It was incorrect in 2020. And um, depending upon which side of the political divide you're on, you might be happy or angry about that. But the, the unifying point is that polling is still a very inexact science. And Asimov explored that in psychohistory as well, because, you know, not to give too much away in case anyone hasn't uh, read that, but psychohistory works great until it doesn't work. <laughs> right. And so, you know, that that's one of the great uh, developments in novels. So I consider Isaac Asimov, as you said, you know, I, I, I've been influenced by his work. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, from time to time, I'm asked, like anyone is asked, you know, who are the people who most influenced you? Who are the people who you most know? you know, a new and Marshall McLuhan is still in first place, Hmm. but uh, both in terms of what he wrote that influenced me, but also in terms of my personal relationship with him, having met him and talked to him and Mm -hmm. worked with him on a couple of projects. But uh, Isaac Asimov is a a strong second. And I mean, I'll tell you a quick story about Asimov, which your listeners might like. Asimov loved making money from his writing. I mean, who doesn't love that? But he loved it so much that we're now talking about the 1980s, as the early 1980s. Asimov is a world-famous writer. He doesn't need any more money. But um, 
I'm now recently, you know, finished with my PhD in media ecology, and I'm beginning to branch out and write and do other things. And the, one of the first things I do is this uh, collection of essays in pursuit of truth on the philosophy of Karl Popper. So I get a good group of people to do essays, but I need someone to write a forward. And um, I'm asking people for their advice. Someone recommended Prince Charles, by the way. Oh. <laughs> I dismissed that. At hand. <laughs> but in retrospect, how I should have, you know, now that I'm older and wiser, I would have contacted him to have him write a forward. But I wound up getting two people to write the forward. Helmut Schmidt, who was finishing up his job as Chancellor of West. Germany, who turned out to be an admirer of Popper. And I came up with the idea of asking Isaac Asimov. And uh, so I told uh, the uh, the publisher of Humanities Press, I'm going to get these two guys to do the forward. I said, look, Helmut Schmidt, he's, he's in politics. He, he'll just be happy to do it. But Isaac Asimov, you know, he's, he's a commercial writer. How much money can we give him? And I thought that the publisher, Simon Silverman, in fact, was his name. Um, and I went down to see him in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. That's where they had their offices. Uh, I thought he'd say, all right, well, offer him a thousand dollars or we can pay him more if need be. And he looks at me and says, uh, you know, tell him we can give him a hundred dollars. I say, are you kidding me? He said, no, you know, trust me. I, I know Isaac Asimov, he'll take the hundred dollars. <laughs> So I call Isaac Asimov up and I basically, I, I, you know, I said, okay, I might be interested in doing this, you know, writing this uh, forward. And then I, I, I force myself to say, because I can hardly get the words out. And by the way, the publisher can pay you a hundred dollars for this. And I'm ready for him to hang up the phone. And instead he says, sure, thank you very much. And you know, wh when can you get the uh, manuscript over? He, he lived on West 66th street. So again, in those days, no email. When did I get the manuscript over? I drove down that night and left it with the doorman uh, in, in, to his building on uh, West 66th Street. So um, that doesn't have that much to do with general semantics, but it's one of my favorite stories about Isaac Asimov. And so in the case of Asimov, unlike Van Vogt and most other science fiction writers, I, I knew him to some extent as a human being. What make what made him take what he loved. Uh, by the way, another interesting thing about Asimov, he um, had some kind of agoraphobia and mm -hmm. rarely, if ever, took a plane. And, uh, you know, he he unfortunately uh, passed away, I guess, in the early 1990s, uh, a little before, you know, well, a lot before there was Zoom and this kind of what we're doing, but even before there was a web or whatever, because he would have excelled in that. He would have, he would have, or you would, you wouldn't even have had to pay him a hundred dollars to do this podcast. You could have probably said, Isaac, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a 10 spot, $10. Okay. He would have said, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just suppose, I mean, you mentioned, you know, just on the point about psychohistory and, uh, and Karl Popper for that matter, you know, that we're sort of in the realm where, where the belief in science kind of starts to give way to more questions and suspicions about it, uh, you know, at least about uh, it solving all our problems. Yeah, well, look, that's unfortunate. It's part of the assault on rationality itself that we are currently uh, seeing in the world. Now, it didn't begin uh, now, for sure. You know, in, in addition to everything else, uh, what Hitler and the Nazis were up to is, is substituting fascism which is basically, this is what I think. Uh, well, someone said, well, I don't completely uh, agree with that. Could you explain that? Their answer is no, you either believe it or I'll kill you. And that's basically, that that's textbook fascism. And, you know, we, so we, the good guys, won World War to, but that it didn't uh that was not a total victory over that kind of attack on rationality that kind of attack on reason and 
the attack on reason is an attack on logic. It's an attack on truth. It's an attack on science. And, uh, you know, that and, you know, to tie that into the COVID pandemic, unfortunately, we see it expressed there. You know, I, I don't need a vaccination. I don't want a vaccination. Why not? Well, because, you know, I heard that Bill Gates uh, uh, somehow managed to put microchips. He, he made a deal with <laughs> Pfizer. You know, and that's a good science fiction story, by the way. But um, I, I wish who, these people who thought that rather than actually saying that this is true had written it as a science fiction story, then at least it would have had some uh, value as just a crazy, interesting idea. But it, but it's not uh, true. And, you know, you're completely right. Isaac Asimov and the, the science fiction magazine, you know, and, and I, I'm also very interested in the history of pulp magazines and, you know, the 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 two big magazines that started way back in the 1930s and even a little before were amazing stories started by uh, Hugo Gernsback and astounding stories. Um, and uh, John Campbell was not the first, but the early and really prominent editor there published Asimov's first stories and so on. Most of my stories over the years have been published in analog, and they were uh, acquired by the previous editor, now previous editor, Stan Schmidt. And when Stan was asked, well, what is a, an analog story? What, what do you want to see in a story? And what he said is, uh, I want a story, obviously, in which there is some kind of problem, some kind of extreme life and death or whatever problem, uh, whatever it might be. And obviously, this is science fiction, so you can make stuff up, you know, for what the problems are. But I want our, and, and basically the characters don't need, necessarily need to be human, but I want the characters, and in particularly the protagonist, to have a reasonable chance of dealing with the problem by applying science and thinking about it. And that was, and is, I still assume, uh, Stan Schmidt's definition of science fiction. And again, this gets into Kwasipski too. You you can get into all kinds of definitions. So if 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 uh, if, if your um, problem is a time travel problem, and if you believe, as I do, that time travel is impossible, um, can you then think rationally about something that's scientifically impossible? Well, my answer is yes. And, you know, most science fiction uh, people uh, will agree with that. Um, but, um, you know, you, you, I've seen arguments, well, no, uh, time travel is really science fantasy or it's just fantasy. Um, and then on the other hand, you have something like Lord of the Rings, which I know you're a big fan of. And, you know, I am too, but probably not as much as you. But I wrote an article years ago defending Lord of the Rings saying, Look, it's not science fiction, it's fantasy, but it's still very rigorously written. It's still something that appeals to our rationality, our sense of reason to solve the problems that the characters use that. So, you know, there is, I think, too much uh, concern over what do we call this. And Karl Popper always said, don't waste so much time worrying about definitions. You know, and this again gets into Kwasipski. Don't worry, you know, that much about the map. It's the territories, the reality that is mm -hmm. described that has the ultimate impact. There's no doubt that uh, science at this moment is under assault uh, from fascists all over the world. And as part of that, science fiction is not taken as, as something as culturally significant as what it had been taken to be in the past. Because in the past, because science was recognized, let's talk just about vaccines. So I remember in the 1950s, I went to get my polio you know, uh, vaccination. I was thrilled. You know, I didn't like the pain in my arm. But however, I was in sixth grade then. I remember that very clearly, or maybe uh, you know, an earlier grade. But I, I uh, had enough sense to realize, well, 
look, I don't want a shot in my arm. Who wants the pain? But I, I don't want to get polio. So, you know, I'll, yeah, th thanks for giving me this shot. And uh, it was unimaginable back then, which was also the golden age of science fiction, that there would come a time, you know, 60, 70 years later, when there, there would be people who would be attacking that. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that's the world we live in. And it's what makes it so dangerous. It's actually a, a problem that comes up, I think, for general semantics itself, because I think for Korzybski, for Hayakawa, for all those, you know, Wendell Johnson, that was unimaginable, too, that they all took for granted that science was the way to solve problems. And then, of course, it was there's a great point you made about the um the editor's idea of science fiction solving using science to solve problems uh that that was really the whole basis of general semantics except applied to everyday life and also to things like politics and and economics and so forth uh i i did want to add i mean you keep you know you kept saying about fascism uh ironically i mean it's also communism where that that happens even though uh, you know, kind of Marxist uh, theory, so to speak, um, was put forth as scientific, but ultimately in practice, the, they did the same thing. They ignored reason in favor of, you know, either believe this or or not. Um, and uh, it's not just reason, but it's also facts, you know, the facts that are on the ground, the empiricism, evidence, um, you know, that they dismiss because if it doesn't fit into ideology or simply the authoritarian impulse, just do what I say, um, then it's rejected. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. And, and maybe it's good to distinguish between socialism and communism. Socialism, mm -hmm. Karl Marx's theory, I don't particularly endorse that either, by the way, you know, I, I, but that's yet another issue. But I certainly think it's not an unreasonable hypothesis for how the economies of countries should be organized. And, and I think it does have some some very good points to it. Uh, but it is something that's based in logic and research. And the, although communism claims that it's an exponent of that. Uh, it, as you correctly point out, reason goes out the door if anyone dares to disagree with what the you know communist uh, authority wants, both internally and tragically, what we're you know seeing uh, you know today in you in Ukraine. I mean, literally today, is mm. is someone Vladimir Putin. He may not be a communist in name, but clearly he takes his inspiration from the Soviet Union. And uh he, he doesn't care about facts. Um he doesn't care about history. He he just wants to expand Russia, in effect reconstitute the Soviet Union. And if you don't agree with him and you make enough noise about it, and you're you're in Russia. You, you'll probably be wind up either in prison or thrown off a, a balcony or poisoned with some horrible poison. And you know the the whole uh, invasion of Ukraine is based. Ukraine didn't agree that it's part of Russia. It may it, it may have been part of the Soviet Union. They also have to some extent an independent history. By the way, look, we here in the United States are no angels either. I mean, if you go back to the Civil War, those states wanted to leave the United States also. Thomas Jefferson, had he been alive, I don't know if he would have endorsed uh, you know, literally the states leaving the union, but he would have said, look, a state should have the right to leave the union. Mm -hmm. And and so there were authoritarian elements. I mean, we should make no mistake about it. The, the government itself is always authoritarian. It always gets to the point. And one of the things which uh, I used to teach classes in propaganda, that's always worth pointing out is propaganda, as you and I well know, because we're both parents, propaganda begins in the home, where basically parents basically propagandize their little kids all the time. And we say it's for their own good, and sometimes it is. So in other words, you're crossing the street, and you have like a little toddler, and the toddler says, I don't want to hold your hand. 
And you say, well, you, you, know, you, you know, you have to hold. I don't want to hold your hand. Well, look, you know, it's a little dangerous out here in, in the street. So, and it gets to the point where you have to say, okay, look, you, you, I don't care what you think. We need to get to the other side of the street. You, you, you know what? You're not only so wrong about not wanting to hold my hand, I'm going to pick you up and hold you as we cross the street. And the kid might scream and yell, you know, uh, you know, put me down or whatever. And you don't do that. And we say correctly that as parents, that's where reason and rationality have to end. Because if somebody is incapable as a toddler might be in understanding that rational argument, you have to do the, the safe thing. But the problem with fascism and communism is they treat their adults like children. And it, it's it's clear to them, the the authoritarian leader uh, leaders that, hey, this is the right thing to do, but uh, they don't allow for any dissent and, or even dialogue. That's an interesting analogy because it brings to mind for me George Lakoff's point about the metaphor for nation is that of family and that on the kind of conservative or right-wing side, that metaphor is expressed as the strict father who must be obeyed. And so it has nothing to do with the um, specifics, with the content. It's purely the relationship of obey father Whereas on the left or on the liberal side, it's the nurturing parent, you know, it's like, are you okay? Are you comfortable? Is there more that I can do for you? Uh, you know, kind of thing. But, uh, you know, just on the point about communism, again, you, you know, I spent a couple of months in China over, over a couple of years. And at one point, I was in a discussion there. And I brought in some Marxist theory, which I, you know, I've had some background in. I don't claim to be an expert in it, but, you know, I figure, you know, let me appeal to them by discussing some aspects of, you know, contemporary Marxist theory. And one of the professors there sort of like said to me in a kind of quiet way, he said, you know, he, you know, I know that in the West, you you people discuss Marxist theory and hegemony and 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 all of this, you know, ideology. But here, we don't discuss it. You know, it's not something that you bring up. You know, it's just you know the implication being that it's just something that you obey. It's that's handed down to you. Um, but we, you know, we. It, I think it's you know in light of what we've been talking about that you know Marx did have a theory of history. You know that he tried to apply science to history. So in a way, it it was a kind of precursor for Asimov's psychohistory. Um, you know, as well as McLuhan's uh, you know own theory. And before him, Harold Innes, you know, that they're all um, looking at, you know, trying to come up with a sort of science or, or scholarly view of history, theory. Of history. Yes, well, there, there's no doubt determinism. And, uh, you know, one of our favorite topics, because it's so much fun to look at in history, you know, you, you put aside other things and you focus on how one kind of thing has influenced politics and just the evolution of human life and therefore all life on this planet throughout history. And yeah, so in the case of uh, of Marx and Marxism, you have a science of economics. In, in the in the case of Innes and McLuhan, you have well communications media, whatever the dominant medium is, you know, at its uh, zenith, it has all kinds of other consequences. And you know, uh, you and I have given an enormous amount of thought about it. I'm sure a day doesn't go by in which uh, people like uh, you and and me and uh, anyone who teaches this stuff and thinks about it do doesn't look at the world and see it almost literally changing before our very eyes. And why is it changing? Well, in large part because we get our news now on Twitter. And now that Musk has taken over Twitter, what is that doing to the way we get our news? And, and not only that, if you're much younger than we are, we get they, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old, thoroughly rational human beings who should not be under such strict parental control, who shouldn't be treated like toddlers, that where are they? 
they getting their news? TikTok. And by the way, this gets back to China because TikTok is a Chinese company. So I just saw a report today. I think, you know, uh, University of Texas in Austin, I think they're somehow trying to ban TikTok when, when, you, when students go on their campus and you're using their uh, app to uh, for Wi-Fi <laughs> You can't get to TikTok because they're concerned that the Chinese might somehow be using it to infiltrate uh, American culture. But so, yes, th there's there's no doubt all of these determinisms, uh, wh whether it's McLuhan, uh, Marx. By the way, Freud, of course, is another. What what determines human civilization for Freud? Well, libido and thanatos, the way we deal with these very, very profound instincts and emotions. And all of them are right to some extent, and all of them have their limits, and all of them are useful because they help bring order to a, an otherwise totally incohate world. Well, since you brought up Elon Musk, uh, and I know that you know in the past you've been a uh, st staunch advocate of free speech, and and certainly you know in connection to rationality and the Enlightenment, the idea of the free marketplace of ideas uh, was seen as essential. Um, what are your thoughts about? about Musk and, and Twitter and what we've seen uh, in these recent developments? Well, John Maynard Keynes is alleged to have said, and I'm not sure if he's the one who said it, you know, it's like one of these things, I'm surprised they didn't say Winston Churchill or Oscar Wilde uh, was responsible for saying this because they usually get all the credit. But John Maynard Keynes, the world famous economist who originally opposed government spending to help get countries out of the Great Depression, saw how well uh, FDR's policies were working in the United States in the 1930s and came to endorse what FDR was doing. So uh, one of his Republican supporters uh, in the United States uh, at some point wrote to him and said, uh, what's up with you, uh, John? You used to be such an opponent of government spending. And uh, Keynes is alleged to have answered him, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? And I, 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 always, I always love that quote. And uh, that's what happened to me um, regarding my view of free speech. And, and just to sort of broaden this out a little bit so our listeners understand this, a lot of my focus on there should be no regulation at all of speech came about in response to ridiculous things like why are the Grammys bleeped? So when you have a rap artist up there performing his or her song, you can hear all the words. And, you know, why did uh, people go so ballistic because uh, Janet Jackson's naked breast was shown for a split second in a Super Bowl halftime? So it, it was things like that that uh, got me to say over and over again, I'm an absolutist when it comes to the First Amendment. I don't want the government to make any rules and regulations whatsoever. And I still feel that way about those cultural things. But I always also felt, even though I didn't much talk about it, that the one thing that I hold in higher esteem, something that needs to be valued and protected, even more than freedom and freedom of speech itself, is life. And I remember back in the 1950s, there used to be an idiotic question. I don't know who came up with this, probably some Republican. Uh, and, and the question was something, would you rather be red or dead? And red didn't refer to, you know, having a sunburn or something. Red would you rather live in a communist country or be dead. And I remember seeing people on television, and actually they were Republicans, saying, I would rather be dead, you know, than live in a communist country. And I remember thinking, again, I was a little kid. What kind of stupidity? What kind of <laughs> foolishness is that? Because if you're dead, you're out of it, right? 
if you are read by what they meant by that, you're living in a communist country, you can have a chance of escaping. Maybe you can overthrow, you know, that government, which sometimes happens. In other words, while there's life, there's still hope. So with that answer as a little kid, and I've always felt that way, I always felt that that life itself uh, is, is uh, more important than freedom. Inconvenience uh, is is not more important than freedom. So I'm still a, somewhat, I've always been a critic of Oliver, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., famous or infamous clear and present danger decision in the Shank case in 1919, in which he said, uh, you know, he's in favor of free speech, but not when it's shouting, falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater. By the way, that's often just said, I almost just did it myself. It's not shouting fire in a crowded theater. That might be a good idea, by the way, because, you know, people should know you got to get out of there. But falsely shouting fire is malicious, and it's certainly inconveniencing the public. But I didn't, I didn't think that was a very good uh, standard, and I still don't, because, yes, it's possible people might trample each other as they're running out of the theater. If that's what uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. was talking about, okay, I grant them that. But for the most part, it's a malicious act that inconveniences people, ruins their evening. And I would say, no, you people should be allowed to say stupid things. People should be allowed to play practical jokes. Uh, people should be allowed to lie. People should be allowed to, we have been saying nothing but negative things about fascism. I, I would always be interested in having a rational debate with a fascist, let the fascist make his or her point. I think I could answer them and win the argument, assuming the audience yeah. was open to a rational argument. So I, I think the First Amendment should protect all those things. But when a communication directly endangers, directly jeopardizes human lives. That's where I am not an absolutist any longer about the First Amendment. And this first came about, and Elon Musk was part of this, but it was before he took over Twitter. Um, and it first came about in my noticing, and you know, I'm sure you've seen it too, these insane uh, things that were on Twitter, on Facebook, et cetera, about the COVID pandemic, including, by the way, that insanity uh, uh, about uh, inserting uh, Bill Gates, inserting a microchip into the vaccine. I first found out about that because someone, I, I got like a, a, a video sent to me, I don't know why me, on Facebook, you know, saying, you should watch this video, Dr. Levinson. And in the video, there was a woman who was wearing a white doctor's smock and uh, you know look very professional and she very patiently explained how she's done years of research and she's come to the sad conclusion that Gates has indeed put microchips in into the vaccines and um I remember when I when I saw that I began saying you know what um I, th the social media need to take these things off their systems. Because if this even influences one person not to get vaccinated, and God forbid that person dies, it's the fault of the social medium as well as whoever made that in the first place for getting that out there. So that's when I began saying, we, and, I, and then people would ask me, well, what if the social media don't take action? But they had begun to, to take action, remove that. I said, well, ultimately, then the government sooner rather than later has to step in. So here's where Elon Musk comes, comes into this. I, I couldn't believe my eyes because I was a great admirer of Elon Musk. As you know, space is one of my other big things. I want to get off this planet. I've never gotten over watching Star Trek. And, and yeah. there are some folks who'd like to see you off the planet too. <laughs> <laughs> All too many, for sure. <laughs> And, you know, so I always admired Musk and Jeff Bezos and all these people, uh, Richard Branson, who are doing, you know, the private enterprise work to try on their own, in addition to government, to get human beings off this planet. I, I thought and still think that's a very, very good thing. So I followed Musk on Twitter. 
And I was horrified to one day see he begins, uh, this is before he on Twitter, he begins uh, presenting his views that, uh, uh, and they sounded oddly familiar, uh, you know, the pandemic will be over in a month or two. And, you know, maybe you should look into hydrochloroquine or whatever it's called. That's a good remedy. Just a series of things. And if, if they sound familiar to our listeners, I don't know who got <laughs> that from whom, but Trump uh, was saying that pretty much the mm -hmm. same things at the time. And, and that was very dangerous also. And I remember thinking, I, I don't know what's wrong with this guy. Musk, but but he uh, is uh, encouraging information that's going to kill people. A as simple as that. You know, people think it's going to be over soon, and you know, d don't make such a big deal out of it. That you know, it doesn't matter that thousands and thousands of people are dying every day at the height of the pandemic. And he, and unfortunately, by the way, still continuing, although to a lesser extent, people are still dying. So, I began keeping an eye on Musk in a different way. And I was not happy when I heard that, well, Musk made this bid to take over Twitter. But I was happy again when it looked like they were going to turn the bid down. But then they, the previous owners of Twitter's accepted the bid. But then I was happy again. See, I, I'm very easy to make happy when yeah. I heard that Musk said, you know what, I don't want all this aggravation. I'm withdrawing. Right. right, right, and then those idiots who own Twitter took him to court and basically compelled him to go through on his bid. So um, I've been very unhappy with what Musk uh, has done uh, as you know the the new owner of Twitter. I don't uh, object at all, and I think it's healthy to have political opinions that I drastically disagree with on. Twitter. If if you want to say that I think that billionaires should pay in effect no taxes because they bring so much good to the country, they start up so much business. Uh, hey, you're entitled to your opinion. I think it's drastically wrong, but I think the First Amendment should and does protect those kinds of opinions. So, and Musk has plenty of those opinions, but what I don't have, you know, any tolerance for, and in fact think uh, are dangerous, is the way that he has opened up the system and invited back people who in fact were thrown off the system because of what they were saying about COVID. The other thing, just to bring this full circle, COVID isn't the only thing that's jeopardized human lives. And, and these two are related. The, the 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 MAGA people make America great again. The 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 Biden will Trump adherents. They are threatening human lives. It happened on January 6, twenty twenty one. You've probably just heard the news that back in December there was some guy Pena, I think his name is, out in New Mexico. He lost the election. He lost it by a mile. He bought into the Trumpist nonsense that uh, that the election was rigged. Um, uh, but rather than trying to demand a recount or whatever, uh, which is actually as bad as that is, what he did is far worse. He went around shooting up the homes of three or four people, you know, you know, some of the vote counters, Democrats, etc. Fortunately, no one was hurt. I, I mean, I was really horrified to see the. In one case, bullets went through a home. Uh, a girl woke yeah, up and yeah. found what she thought was sawdust in her bed. That's how close, you know, the bullet, it, it was the. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, Musk basically is not only dangerously wrong on what he said about COVID and dangerously wrong in allowing those things, although I think he, his bark is worse than his uh, bite. I think he's, Twitter itself has not allowed just anything about COVID on Twitter as yet, but he's also endangering lives by uh, encouraging that kind of rhetoric that stirs up violent insurrections, that stirs up people, election deniers who think their next way of dealing with this is to pick up a gun and, and shoot people. And uh, as long as Musk keeps doing that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, he and 
Twitter are not entitled to First Amendment protection for those kinds of communications. Maybe to circle back to science fiction now, but uh, you know, picking up on the libertarian aspect, I mean, someone who fits that bill and who you mentioned before was Robert Heinlein. Uh, and he was also, and he was actually a student of Krasipsky's. So uh, you're curious about your thoughts about Heinlein. Yeah, Heinlein is is great, and you know, there's been a uh, an ongoing uh, debate among uh, science fiction lovers ever since I was a little kid. It was that's the way people ask, who do you think is better, Asimov or Heinlein? I mean, in a way, uh, why do you have to even say that? For the reasons I explained, I prefer Asimov, you know, a little more than Heinlein. But Heinlein, I think, is also one of the brilliant uh, people uh, in science fiction, one of the brilliant writers on all kinds of levels. Um, and, and some of the things he's done, I think even Asimov hasn't uh, achieved. For example, the moon is a harsh Mistress um, is just a great novel in which AI, as we know it, I mean, Asimov looked into AI in terms of robots, but in Moon is a Horse Mistress, uh, there is a uh, an AI system that's installed on the moon. And that was an early and brilliant exposition of, of what centralized computer systems can do. I think when it comes to time travel, Although my favorite time travel novel is still Isaac Asimov's The End of Eternity. I highly recommend it. By the way, believe it or not, there's a Russian version in, that was done in 1987 uh, with English subtitles in the Soviet Union. Not bad. Not bad. I guess Gorbachev had already opened up the Soviet Union a little bit, so it was, it was pretty good. Um but um, he, in a series of short stories, all you zombies by his bootstraps, uh, th those are among the best time travel short stories ever written, period, uh, including Asimov's uh, work. And um, The Door into Summer, um, I would say, in, in my view, if I hold The End of Eternity to be the best science fiction novel, The uh, the Door into Summer is, is a close second. Very different mm -hmm. science. Time yeah. travel novel. Ta right, time travel novel. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, and who wrote the uh the, the, the Heinlein. The the summer, the door into summer. The door into summer, Heinlein, Robert right. Heinlein like that. And, and um it's very, you know, Asimov always tends to deal with these like, well, not always, but most of the time, these sweeping world histories, um, which is what the foundation is. It said he was inspired by Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. So and, and Heinlein sometimes does that, but Heinlein does something that I really have always also loved in science fiction. And the way I think of that is you're walking down the street, could be a street in Manhattan, could be someplace in the Bronx, it could be a you know, street in any town, and you pass by a variety of stores. And little do you realize that behind the doors of one of those stores could be a dry cleaning store, it could be a UPS store, who knows what it is? There's some kind of strange science fictional business going on inside that store. Or you could say, you know, you're living on a block of people. There's one house where you don't know that much about the neighbors. You never particularly see them in the backyard. You, you, you do see them drive in, but they have the kind of garage where the, the door opens up, they go in. And again, what Heinlein really uh, achieved the epitomes in was writing stories about those people might come from a planet circling Proxima Centauri, and and, and you don't, you don't really know about it. And I always love that element of science fiction, and no one did it as well as Heinlein. But I'm glad you mentioned you know that he he was a he he loved Korzybski. He Heinlein in his own way was also a student of science. And he also was an epitome of a hard science fiction writer. And that was always in everything he was uh, writing and thinking about. Well, I've got one more to toss at you. I mean, there actually are others, but um, one more big one who's a little bit later, 
but not too much later, Frank Herbert, and was less Korzybski, but uh, worked with Hayakawa and and general semantics worked into his Dune series and other stuff, as well as, of course, his background in ecology. Yeah, and I just want to point out, as I'm sure our listeners know, Hayakawa, of course, not only did really pathbreaking work in general semantics, but served in the U.S. Senate uh, <laughs> for a period of time. So th- th- I-, I always thought that was a wonderful thing. He was Republican. I was glad that I didn't live in California because I don't know if I could have brought myself to vote for a Republican, but I was very glad that somebody who had such a role in general semantics uh, actually was in the United States Senate. And of course, he was nothing like some of the Republicans or most of the Republicans, you know, are today. Um, yes, I think, you know, Frank, Frank Herbert, the, the, uh, the di- if you think about just um, Asimov, Heinlein and Herbert, it, it, it's very interesting to look at the similarities and differences there. For everything that I just said about Heinlein, he never wrote a series uh, a trilogy and ultimately even more that w- that was anything close to what the foundation trilogies or the robot stories were for Asimov. And so when we talk about who the best science fiction writers are, the most important science fiction writers are, and we try to limit it, who wrote path-breaking series? Who wrote series that was so good that they were continued by writers even after the death of the original author? Who wrote a series that was so good that they were made into movies and television shows? And by the way, we haven't talked about Philip K. Dick. He also is right up there in that pantheon. Um, And also is very, very uh, important on the issue of what's reality, what's not reality. Mm -hmm. But to get to Frank Herbert, I, I would put his Dune trilogy and by extension, the novels that came afterwards as the second best trilogy and the second best series of novels that went beyond the trilogy in science fiction. And uh, again, each uh, person has has their strengths. Um, In terms of ecology, not media ecology, but ecology in in the original meaning, uh, Asimov never spent that much time, you know, talking about the places where his characters lived. I mean, he he was throwing, you know, Calgon, you know, the the beauty world or whatever, or this or that. And he he would give them like a phrase. But uh, Herbert described... Arrakis, Dune, what was going on there in unbelievably explicit and therefore memorable and and pungent detail. And um, there, by the way, there was a movie made of uh, Dune in the 1980s, which I thought was not too good. But uh, part one of a two-part movie uh, was uh, on some streaming network last uh, year I saw it. I really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to part two. I think this current two-part movie version of Dune does live up to Frank Herbert's work, and I think they've done a great job on that. Uh, and you mentioned Philip K. Dick, and my understanding, what I've heard, is that um, he was uh, indirectly influenced by Korzybski through Van Van Volk. Right. Um, right. So we we kind of came full circle here um but certainly uh another uh significant science fiction writer is by the name of paul levinson and uh uh you recently came up with a very interesting kind of story about the beatles um and you know perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that you know all of us i mean certainly people our age uh have grown up in a world and maybe, and I was going to say maybe, but it was like that beforehand. It's just that the people who were assassinated have changed. So Abraham Lincoln wasn't assassinated when we were alive. But, um, you know, for me, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Obviously, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. We just celebrated a holiday uh, that, that basically tr- tries to bring forth his ideas. And um, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. And uh, th- those those assassinations really changed m- my life. But there was also an assassination of somebody who was never elected to office, 
wasn't president of anything. Maybe you could say like Martin Luther King, he was a champion of reforming the world to some extent, but he, you know, that was part of his oeuvre, but he's most known uh, as the member of the Beatles, John Lennon, and um, he um, also did a lot of really good work even after the Beatles broke up. So I, I was really uh, devastated when he was... Um, killed uh, he, here in New York uh, back in 1980. And, um, you know, calamities like other things tend to, somehow the universe likes to force them upon us at the same time or in proximity. And th this happened right around the time that Marshall McLuhan died. And I remember uh, Tina and I went up to Marshall McLuhan's funeral. And I, I said to, I was speaking to Josh Meyerowitz, I said, are you, and he was married then to Candy Leonard, are you and, you know, Candy going to come up? And he said, oh, well, we were thinking about it, but we're going to New York uh, to, you know, at, at this uh, ceremony uh, in, in Central Park. It was right after John Lennon had been assassinated. And Candy Leonard has gone on to at least write one book about the Beatles. So she was, you know, a devout follower of the Beatles. And I remember thinking to myself, look, I understand. And I said this to Jack, no, I understand that completely. Uh, but I, you know, I, I knew Marshall McLuhan. I didn't know John Lennon. So I'm, Tina and I are going up to, to, to his funeral. And of course, famously, they didn't meet, those two met each other in Toronto. And there's some right. film of that. That's right. That, that that's great. There's, I think, even a video of them. It was yeah. when he was recording "Give Peace a Chance." I mean, it was, and other things up there. But even though I did go to Marshall McLuhan's funeral, uh, my heart was still broken uh, about what happened to John Lennon. And um, obviously, like everything else, that's something I, I'm upset about to this very day. And. Before I tell you about uh, the, the story, uh, it's, it's real life, um, and this relates to the story, the, the next important event, though, in, in that development of these ideas and thoughts and feelings in me was the release of the two-sided record in the 1990s, Free as a Bird on one side, Real Love on the other side. And... Um, Again, I don't know whether this is true or not. You could lots of different, you know, reports. But basically, the story is that Yoko Ono gave Paul McCartney three demos that John had recorded before his death, including Free as a Bird, uh, Real Love, and another song called Then and Now, or Now and Then, I'm not sure. And uh, the idea was that the Beatles would use Lennon and his recording to, to make these new records, which they did. They got uh, Jeff Lynn to produce. George Martin didn't want to do it because it was like too upsetting for him. I, I don't uh, blame him at all for being upset. Ringo Starr has said it was like, it was, it's like John was here and then he went out to get a cup of tea and we just put on, you know, some other tracks. I don't know how much of this is true. George Harrison was not that happy with the whole project, so much so that he said no to doing a third record on that then and now uh, other demo. But but they did these two records. The Beatles came out then, and they're the last records that were therefore done by the Beatles after John Lennon was gone. And they were Free as a Bird and Real Love. And uh, yeah, everyone has their favorites. I, I like Free as a Bird, but Real Love always struck me. You know, there's something that just, just got right to me. I could hear Lennon's voice. Every time I heard that song, it all, and to this very day, it almost brings tears to my eyes. And um, one other thing about that song is uh, I found that it was originally, the song was originally called Real Life. It had the same melody. So Lennon was saying, it's real life. It really is. But he changed it at some point to real love. So I've been thinking about this, but it's been rolling around in my head all these years. And, you know, COVID, like everything else, has unintended consequences. And uh, I found that, you know, I started writing a story a couple of years ago, but I wasn't that happy with it. So I let it, you know, lay fallow for a while. And it was, you know, maybe like December 
let's see, it's now January 2023. So we're talking about maybe December 2021. Uh, I began thinking about it and, you know, looking at what I'd written. And then I sat down and I wrote this story. And uh, I, I called the uh, story it's real life. It's an alternate history story. The other essential element in the story is someone else that you and I both knew, Pete Fornatel. I, um, I was thinking that he must have something to do with this too. Yes, and um, I, um, you know, he tragically died. Um, it was a couple of years before COVID. I, it was, I guess, it was a heart attack. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but way too young, and. Um, I listened to his music when he played it on Mixed Bag as a student at Fordham in the 1960s. Little did I know then that at some point in the future, and this is, life is interesting, I'd be teaching at an institution and where he would be back at WFUV. And um, yeah, yeah, I remember I, growing, you know, growing up and listening. Was it PIX? Uh, NEW. He, oh, he went, he, yeah. Yeah, on FM and That's listening. Right. You know, that's it was right. him and Allison Steele was another one. That, you know, that's right. All of the great DJs uh, right. when FM was new and they were playing a lot of the longer form or album oriented rock and progressive music and all of that. Exactly. And Dennis Elsis, by the way, who's currently yeah. still WFUV, he comes from WNEW FM also. Um, so, and by the way, I have to say, I you know, we... Uh, Pete and I had an interesting relationship. At one point, he said to me, I, I, you have an album out or something? This was before my latest album, Welcome Up. This was just when the only album I had out was Twice Upon a Rhyme. I said, yeah, I do. And he said, well, if you send me a CD, I, I'd like to listen. I said, sure, you don't have to ask twice. So I sent him the CD in which actually th this was like a Korean uh, reissue of the album and they asked me for some bonus tracks so I put a song on there called Murray the K's Back in Town Murray the K's Back in Town that I wrote for Murray the K when before I got involved in the academic world I worked with Murray the K when he came back to NBC in the 1970s he was a disc jockey here on WINS and then on uh, WORFM um, and then much to my delight, Pete played that on one of his shows. What, wasn't Murray the K once referred to as the fifth Beatle? Yes, that's right. Yeah. He was a character too, and I got to know him very well. And uh I, you know, he also died way too young. And um, but um I had an enormous amount of fun with him. And I mean it was it was he was the kind of disc jockey where he would ask me to put together sets of songs for him and then occasionally would call me into the studio. Unfortunately, there were no recordings of this. And he'd be talking and saying, hey, you know, sitting at the table is Paul Levinson. He helped me put some of these songs together. I, was, I, I don't even know what we talked about then. But um, that's what when I wrote Murray the Caves Back in Town, I wrote that for a song. So it was great to hear, you know, Pete play that. And, and as a matter of fact, the last time I saw Pete was, I think, Lance, at a conference that you organized at Lincoln Center, maybe like we're talking about 2012 or something, 2013. 2011, uh, probably. Yeah, okay, 2011, right. Oh, yeah, right. The, the McLuhan. The McLuhan thing, that's right. Centenary. That's, that's right. And he, he, as you know, wrote a great book, Pete Fornatel, what was it, Radio in an Age of Television. Yeah, very with Joshua neat, Mills. That's right. And again, a very media ecological sense, because isn't that a great title for a book, television, radio in an age of television? The title yeah. says it all. It's, you know, that radio had to change because of television. So, yeah. So um, what I'll also say about uh, It's Real Life is that I wrote it. It's now being made into a radio play. And it, the radio play is just about finished. And again, just so, you know, in case your listeners don't know, this is a radio play that's being done, being put together remotely. So everyone had to record their own part. And we have all kinds of extraordinary things, like we actually have some music performed in the radio play. Um, but I'm not allowed to say anything more about it. It, it will be done not this month let's hope it'll be done in february maybe even a little longer than that but it, it's it's one of the most exciting things i've ever worked on and now the story 
It's about the Beatles still being together. Well, apropos Philip K. Dick, who in a way mm -hmm. inspired me to write it because he was my introduction to alternate histories. Whenever I write a character of any depth and importance, I'm always writing from myself. And, and, you know, because that's how you get the truest, you know, and that's why it's harder to write a, a woman character for me than a man character. Um, so, you know, I was always very pleased when people said in the plot to save Socrates, Sierra Waters, my female protagonist, was a realistic character because it was, it was tough. So I... I I put myself into Pete Fornatello, but I'm sure he felt the same way. That's the thing, you know, even though I never talked to him about this. So Pete Fornatello plays, uh, you know, a Beatles song and, you know, uh, it, it makes him begin to think again of John Lennon. And he, he thinks of this song uh, and, um Again, it uh, he doesn't know why, but he has like this incohate feeling of dread almost. And so when the show is over, he decides to walk it off by walking in the tunnels that go underneath Fordham University. Now, people often ask me, are those tunnels really there? I've walked a little bit. There is a tunnel underneath. I haven't walked as far as Pete Fornatel does in the novel. <laughs> but a lot of these universities, you know, that were built... City College that were built like in the 1860s, 1870s were built up. They put tunnels underneath uh, the campus. So you, when you were walking in the winter, you didn't freeze to death. Or if it was a pouring rain, you could get from one building to another. So, so Pete Fornatel walks through those tunnels. We learn that Pete Fornatel is living in a world in which the Beatles are still alive and recording. But he has a big surprise when he gets out of the train station in Grand Central Terminal and uh, discovers the world uh, that is all too familiar to us. Would it be too much to ask uh, if you would read a little bit of, of your story uh, I'd be, so, while we're well, waiting for the, for the radio play to come out? Yes, it, it, it would not be too much. I'd be delighted to. All right. So this is called It's Real Life. That's real life from the Beatles' 1985 Come and Go LP. And I'm Pete Fornatel on WFUV's July 4th, 1996 week-long celebration. Pete sighed with a mix of all kinds of deep emotions as the song played. Every time he played that song, every time he heard it, he felt like crying and his eyes burned right now. The song was not only heart-tugging and beautiful, but profoundly unsettling. And he felt that he was somehow connected to it. The Beatles were close to breaking up. Lennon had made that clear in his long interview with Pete's colleague, disc jockey Dennis Elsis, earlier this year. McCartney had too in what he had said about his solo song, My Brave Face, co-written and performed with Elvis Costello. This was the first time any Beatle had done that with a non-Beatle, but no, that was not the reason Pete felt this unspeakable sense of foreboding about the Beatles and about John Lennon in particular. So Pete put another piece of vinyl on the turntable. That was still his favorite way of playing music. Here's one of my all time favorites, Pete said, George's All Things Must Pass from the Beatles' 1974 Band on the Run LP. They brought in Nicky Hopkins to play piano on that one. Pete hoped the song might make his foreboding pass. It only made it worse. He looked at the stained clock on the wall. He had just 12 minutes left to his show. Maybe he'd take a walk in the tunnels below Keating Hall. That had always cleared his mind when he first started walking there when he was a student here at Fordham University back in the 1960s. He'd found it cleared his mind now too, since he'd returned to Fordham and WFUV about two years ago. 
No one knew exactly when or why these tunnels had been built, likely near the end of the 19th century, in one of Fordham's many expansions, so students could go from one building to another without getting frostbitten in winter or drenched in the spring. There was a rumor that Edgar Allan Poe had something to do with constructing them, and one of the tunnels went straight to his home up on Kingsbridge Road. Not likely, but who knew? Poe's cottage on Kingsbridge off the Grand Conquest, well, that was definitely real. On this Tuesday after July 4th, the tunnels were danker than usual. But Pete didn't mind. He was kindly disposed to the fungus or lichen or whatever it was on these walls. And the dankness, well, it was part of their charm. There were all kinds of stories about what existed or what could be done in the tunnels, ranging from ghosts to teleportation portals to Pete's favorite. <laughs> he would encountered it in a science fiction story written by a professor in the communications department a few years ago, a story about how the tunnels, these very tunnels, were conduits to alternate reality. Pete felt vaguely relieved. The very thought of alternate realities made him feel better. Maybe, maybe he could get to an alternate reality where he wasn't plagued by this incohate feeling of dread about John Lennon. Hmm. He'd been thinking so hard. He'd walked a little further than he'd intended in the tunnels. He didn't recall seeing that thick wooden door before. There were plenty of them here and there in the tunnels, but they were always locked. He'd once asked the maintenance guy in Keating what was behind them, and the guy had said cleaning supplies. Well, this one wasn't locked. Maybe someone on the maintenance crew had left it open accidentally or because he was in the middle of a job. Pete couldn't resist. He opened the door. All he saw in front of him was another tunnel with no sign of cleaning supplies. He walked through the door and in the tunnel beyond for a few minutes, he saw nothing unusual, the same mottled walls and the occasional door bolted shut. He looked at his analog watch. He'd been in these tunnels too long and realized he was now in danger of coming late to his appointment with the WNET people. That was in just an hour. This meeting was important. They wanted Pete to host a retrospective on the Beach Boys another one of his favorite groups. He looked back on where he'd been walking. He needed to find a faster way out of here so he could catch either Conrail or Fornham's Ram van downtown, depending on where he was able to exit. He knew there was more than one exit. He'd used multiple exits ever since he'd started walking here in the 1960s. And, ah, there was one, a different kind of door, not bolted. With any luck, there would be a steep flight of stairs upward on the other side. And there was. He sprinted up the stairs so fast his legs hurt. He opened the door to a soft rain. It wasn't bad. He squinted and saw he was on the west end of the campus. Okay, it would be Conrail to Manhattan. He had no idea what its schedule was, but the trains did run pretty often. He walked quickly past Duane Library toward the train station. He loved that old library with its winding steps to shelves overcrowded with books. He heard a train in the distance, and he quickened his pace. It was definitely coming from the north. It would be close, but he was good at catching an arriving train. He knew he could pay on board. He dashed past the ticket booth, nearly collided with an elderly woman, and apologized over his shoulder. He walked through the open doors and smiled. He rushed down the stairs to the tracks just as the train came into the station. He always enjoyed these last minute boardings. He sat on one of the worn cloth seats and awaited the conductor. A woman soon approached in a tight uniform and a book of tickets. Grand Central Terminal, Pete told her. She nodded, $5, she said. Pete gave her a $5 bill and she reciprocated with a ticket stub. 
As she walked away, Pete noticed that it said Metro North on the back of her uniform. He hadn't seen that before. It usually just said Conrail. The train arrived at Grand Central about 20 minutes later. A group of buskers caught his ear and eye. The three young women were singing, Yes, It Is. It was one of Pete's most beloved songs. Please don't wear red tonight. Pete looked at his watch. He made good time on the train and he had a few minutes to spare. He took another $5 bill from his wallet and he placed it on the open guitar case, which already had plenty of bills and coins. The women finished the song with the word true in lovely lilting harmony. Thank you, the lead singer, a woman with long black hair said to him, the other two were blonde. The three reminded Pete of the bangles. You were wonderful, Pete said. Do you do requests? The lead singer nodded. How about real life? Pete asked. The woman scrunched her face. You mean real love? I think I read in Rolling Stone that real life was the original name of that song. Is that what you're talking about? Pete shook his head and laughed. He'd read every issue of Rolling Stone and he'd never seen any article or review or interview that said that. He certainly didn't want to insult these singers and tell them he was Pete Fornatel and he no doubt knew much more than they did about the Beatles. He thought for a minute, finally said, okay, could you play me that song? The women nodded and began singing. It was really beautiful, exactly the same as real life, except they were singing real love. It's real love, it really is. Thank you, Pete said when they were finished and he impulsively reached into his wallet. All he had was a $10 bill and a $20 bill. He put the 10 in the open guitar case with a flourish. You deserve it, he said. Isn't that President Reagan? One of the women asked. Pete nodded. When did they change the guy in the money? One of the other women asked. Alexander Hamilton's on my $10 bills. Pete didn't know what to say. He looked at his watch. If he stayed here much longer, he'd be late for his appointment. He pulled his cell phone out of his pocket and called one of the WNET people he was supposed to meet. The phone rang and rang with no answer and no voicemail. He put the phone back in his pocket. He didn't really care about the pictures on the money. He did care about NET, but he cared most about the Beatles. Can you tell me all you know about that song? He asked gently. The women looked at each other. The first one he had talked to looked up at him and considered. Oh, you gave us $5 of real money. So even if the $10 isn't real, I guess your $5 is worth a few minutes more conversation. Thank you, Pete said. When did you last hear that song? I saw the video on MTV the other night, one of the women said. It was very moving. I don't think I've seen that, Pete said. What did you find moving about it? I mean, you know, with Lennon and all, she said. It, it was really emotional. Yeah, Pete said. John always has a voice that pulls at your hearts, doesn't he? And, and seeing him come back to life on that video, on the song, well, that was really something one of the other women who hadn't spoken before said. And there was something like tears in her eyes. Pete opened his mouth to say something, but stopped. This was getting crazier by the minute. What do you mean, come back to life? He finally asked slowly. Had something happened to John Lennon that he hadn't heard about? Pete was thinking, no, no, impossible. All three women looked at him with expressions ranging from suspicious to amazed. You know he was assassinated in 1980, right? The woman with the long black hair finally asked him in a husky voice. 
No, I don't, Pete thought. But to the women, he said, look, I, I, I look, thank you. You have lots of talent and, and apologies for the interruption. He opened his wallet for the 20, but thought the better of it. He might need it for other things. He reached in his pocket and found two quarters. Thanks, he said again, and put them in the tar case. He could hardly keep his mind on what he was doing. He knew these had George Washington on them. These quarters are real, right? All three women nodded. Thanks, Pete said again and hurried away. There had to be a bookstore with an encyclopedia in or near Grand Central. He found a Barnes and Noble on Fifth Avenue. Pete walked as quickly and inconspicuously as he could to the reference book section. He picked up a world encyclopedia and turned to the Beatles. Oh my God! He felt sick to his stomach. The women were right. It said here that John Lennon had been shot to death in December 1980. Pete frantically picked up another encyclopedia and opened it to the Beatles, and then another. God Almighty, same thing, same thing. What the hell was going on? And to find out what's going on, you'll need to actually read the uh, story. And again, uh, in the radio play, you'll hear a lot better voices than mine singing those songs that I sang a little of. And if they want to just Google it, they would um, yes, put in... Just it, it, quote, it's real life, unquote, with an apostrophe, it's uh, as it's real life. And just quote Paul Levinson, unquote, right. and they'll find it that way. Well, I feel like this could go on for, for a few more hours. Um, we're having so much fun here. Uh, but I know we need to wrap up. So, Paul Levinson, this has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. It was my pleasure, and I'll see you tomorrow back at the ranch, a.k.a. <laughs> University. Yes, you will. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. You've been listening to our January 2023 episode of Semantic Reactions, featuring an interview and reading with Paul Levinson. If you like what you've heard, or even if you haven't, please consider becoming a member of the Institute of General Semantics, if you're not one already. In addition to supporting our efforts, IGS members receive an annual subscription to our journal, etc., a review of general semantics, access to our online and in-person events, lectures and seminars, and discounts on the books and audiovisual materials that we sell. Regular membership is only $50 and half off for students. Your membership and any additional donations you care to make will help to support our offerings and activities as we work to bring a measure of sanity to the world. The Institute of General Semantics is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to research and education on a wide range of topics. They include language and symbols, meaning and perception, communication and representation, media and technology, science and epistemology, creativity and critical thinking. We are dedicated to making the world a better place through practical strategies for improving our semantic environment, individually and collectively. For more information about the Institute and our activities, and to become a member and supporter of our work, please visit our website at generalsemantics.org. That's generalsemantics, one word, dot org. And this brings to a close our fifth episode of Semantic Reactions, the official podcast of the Institute of General Semantics. This is Ben Houck, signing off, saying, we hope you'll join us next time. And until then, just remember this simple fact, that the map is not the territory. <laughs> <laughs>